Um, I'm Abra Johnson. I am from Honey Pop Performance and the Chicago Black Social Culture Map, uh, <laughs> which this event is for. Um, again, this is on the radio, 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 the Donna Summer song, um, to talk about local Chicago radio stations and the rise of house music. Um, incidentally, that would also <laughs> include WLS and uh, the radio stations that ignited Burn, Disco Burn, and we should say that um, because that becomes critical uh, to the history of house music. Um, house music becomes disco's revenge, right? This is what Frankie Knuckles said, uh, especially after that incident. Uh, but we're gonna go ahead and start with the second panel. We have up our QR code because I love my data. So it doesn't matter what event you've been to, you can complete this for us. Um, so this is what enables us to inform our grantors that people do show up and we're doing something important. Um, so And so that we can keep the events grant funded and that means free and complimentary snackage and drinks for you. Um, <laughs> so we're gonna start the second panel. Um, I'm actually going to, <coughs> phone's ringing. <laughs> so I just want to give an introduction uh, of our discussion for this panel, uh, who is Lauren Lowry, a uh, great archivist, uh, not just WNUR, uh, uh, vintage house radio personality, but also uh, museumist, curator, uh, archivist herself. Lauren Laurie is a cultural archivist and historian trained in archives management, including collection development, digitization, repository management, and exhibit curation. She is the executive producer of the Vintage House Show on WNUR.org, 89.3 FM, and Vintage House Show TV, Vintage House Show TV, we want to get it correct, and the Vintage House Show podcast, which is Vintage House Show .com. Ms. Lowry has presented at the Society of American Archivists annual meeting, curated the City of Chicago's House Music Symposium, and exhibited at Chicago State University. She has professional certificates from the National Archives and Records Administration in Modern Archives Management and Northwestern University in, in Museum Studies. Thank you, Lauren, for being here today. Uh, Lauren's going to introduce our panel. Thank you, Abra. Thank you. And I'm also proud to be uh, one of the collaborators and members for the Chicago Black Social Culture Map. So this is critically important to all of us, you know, curating and making sure that we're preserving the history of house music. Today, however, we have some of the greatest uh, who've ever done it here in the house with us today. This panel is entitled House Music Foundations, R&B Soul, and House Music via Radio Mixes. So we're going to be talking about past, we're going to be talking about present. Uh, the person to my right is Chris Hutchinson, who is also known as First Lady. What up, First Lady? She is an international and pioneering DJ and house music artist. She is a member of the DJ Hall of Fame and an award-winning radio DJ. Right now, she is the program director at Jam 98, and she'll tell you more about that. First Lady. So if I didn't start off, Chris Hutchinson is also a Whitney Young Dolphin, correct? Oh, Whitney Young Dolphins in the house. You got to give the high school. What's up? You got to give the high schools the, their love. Every time. Every time. <laughs> because Mario Smith here is a Chicago vocational high school That's attendant. Right. <laughs> he is a Hyde Parker, a poet, an educator, a cultural observer, currently a radio host and host of two podcasts that will let him tell you all about. Mario Smith. So guys, again, uh, you all know that it said several times here, I'm a historian and I don't do anything without beginning with history. So I'm gonna ask you all to give me a little bit of your Chicago story. Chris, I'll start with you. Where'd you grow up? Where were you born? How'd you get to Whitney Young? Give me that backstory. 
I noticed you got the Whitney Young part in there. <laughs> More than once. I was born by the river, a little tent. No, okay. Um, so grew up on the south side. Um, right a few doors down from the Jackson family, the other Jacksons, Jesse Jackson family. The Jackson family. So where was right. that? Give me that community. So South, uh, side south Shore, 68th, 67th, okay. Constance. Okay, you're South Shore. Um, Ramsey Lewis's family lived in nice. the neighborhood as well. So uh, Gail Sayers' um, daughter and ex-wife now um, lived in the neighborhood. So as kids, we all played together. Wow. And so it was music and politics that ran throughout the neighborhood mm -hmm. and uh, my father used to who, who was best friends with Herb Kent that's how Herb Kent became my godfather he was a part of the electric crazy people so radio was in my life early on although I love television still love television um, so it was politics radio and music from the from the very beginning uh, growing up I modeled as a kid um, you are stunning, Chris, so oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I did that for a while. Um, when I got to high school, though, I started uh, really doing more cheerleading, so I, I dropped out of that. I met a guy who was a DJ. His name was Steve Poindexter, and I knew that the way through a guy's, um, to a guy's heart was through his hobbies. Because if you can hang out with him besides when you're doing the girlfriend-boyfriend thing, uh -huh. The relationship has a better chance. And so you knew that at age I knew that 13, at 13. 14? Yeah. Wow. Because my mother told me. Interesting. So I thought, oh, okay, well, maybe <laughs> that is right. And as it turned out, it was right. I learned a valuable skill. I learned, that's how I learned how to DJ, was from dating him. Fast forward, I did that throughout, throughout high school. Um, uh, on a dare, we did a DJ battle that Wayne Williams did held at uh, First Impressions. And Lori Branch didn't make this particular uh, battle. It was myself, um, Stacy Saxton, who's from the West Side, um, Angie Hurley, Steve Hurley's little sister, and Celeste Alexander. And uh, when the battle was over, Angie was first, I was second, Stacy was third, and Celeste was fourth. Um, but during that time, there were some guys from Park Avenue Promotions that Stephen Keefe that saw it and a light went off. And they said, we need to put these girls together and create like a hot mix five, but female version. So originally, it would have been the five of us. They had uh, myself, Celeste Alexander, we were from the South Side, and Kenya Lenore, Ricky Lenore's sister, and Bird, Berlando Drake, who's my cousin now through marriage. Um, and it would have been Angie Hurley, but, the, but she couldn't stay out past 9 o'clock. So it was the Fantastic Four instead of the Fantastic Five. That's no joke. The Hurley family did not play. Steve Hurley snuck out to do parties. And he might not say it, but it's the truth. Um, they went to Limbloom, so I know the they whole went story to with, with myself. Yes. Um, so that is how I got ushered into uh, um, radio. What year was that? What that year was, was that, that? The Fantastic that? Four, uh, I want to say it was 83 is when we really, when we first started. I started in, uh, in 80, and I, th I think what happened, how, how the radio piece came to be, was I challenged Farley to, uh, first I walked up to Farley on a challenge and said, um, hey, your name Farley? He said, yeah. I said, I'll batter you anytime I'm a better DJ than you. <laughs> and this is Farley Funkin' Keith, not Farley Jackmaster right, Funk. Same. Farley Funkin' Keith. And nobody had ever challenged him, let alone a little five foot three female. And I just said it, I didn't give him a chance to respond, I turned around and walked off. So that was our meeting each other. Um, we're great friends though. Later on, after uh, doing Used by a DJ, which is a house music song, um, I met DJ International. I see Farley again, and I say, Farley, how come there are no female DJs on radio? And he said, well, make me a tape. So I did, and then that Thursday, I was on the air. That Friday, Xavier Gold was on the air on BMX. I was on GCI, um, but I beat her, so that, that made me first. <laughs> so um, 
that is really what ushered me into radio because the door was open for me at that point. Bonnie DeShong, who is a, very, is a legendary uh, radio personality in Chicago, she was my um, acting teacher at Columbia, and she said, you know, your foot is in the door, you might as well keep going. And I was like, I don't know, I'm going to be on TV, I want to be an actress. And she's like, nah, you should do this. And, uh, and I followed that. Uh, not through Columbia College, it was a little difficult through there, so I ended up at Kennedy King, which, by the way, is one of the best schools to go to for, for broadcasting um, if you're not going to go to a four-year institution. And that is what ushered in um, my love for radio, my real true love for radio. And from that, went to GCI, worked with Rick Party, met this guy, um, left there, went to New York, did the morning show with Isaac Hayes, um, did the morning show with Ed Lover and Dr. Dre, uh, had the, the great honor of having Grandmaster Flash as my DJ on Friday nights, uh, the original Spinderella, who goes by the name of DJ Priest now, she was one of my DJs, um, left there, came back to Chicago, GCI again, left here, went to, uh, to Flint, Michigan, Flint, Michigan. Um, who knew nothing of house music, and I feel like, until I got there. Then uh, came back here, then went to uh, Indianapolis, program there. They are a house music community that is developing. Radio does not support it there. I want to preface it with that. That was very difficult for me to deal with, um, to now being co-owner of Jam 98 with, with my husband. Thank you so much, Chris. Sorry, I just wanted to get it all in there so we didn't have to circle back around. Well, we're going to circle back around because you was dropping names. You dropping all these things. Girl, we got to go back to a whole lot of that. Mario, give me your uh, Chicago story. Where did you grow up? Where did you go to grammar school, you know, then high school? And why, why CVS? It was a dark and stormy night. Um, so I'm from Woodline. I grew up in Jeffrey Manor. I grew up in South Shore. Um... I went to my I went to Luella Elementary School in Jeffrey Manor. I went to Myra Bradwell in South Shore, and I also went to St. Carthage um, for a brief moment. Uh, went to Chicago Vocational High School. I am very proud of that fact. As you can tell from the people clapping in the other room, they are also <laughs> super happy for me. CBS is, that that happened. is like fire, man. Y'all all over the Look, um, I, I do want to say something about that experience, though. I don't think, and I've always wanted to be on the radio. There was never a time in my life, ever, 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 that I did not want to do what I'm doing. I didn't know poetry was going to come into play. I never intended on that. I had no clue that that was going to happen. It happened. I've wanted to be on the radio since I was at least three years old. My cousins used to tape me doing radio shows when I was three. No format. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I was doing it. And that has always been like in my head. I went to CVS always hoping that they would <clears throat> one day have a radio and television department because it is a vocation in as much as learning how to run a lathe or learning how to run a, 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 a Heidelberg press or any of the other great stuff, building a car, whatever, it's a vocation. They eventually had one many years later, ran by the great Roger Badish um, from WGN fame. Um, but anyway, yeah, I went to the V. My college career, we don't really have to talk about that so much. Um, I, I, met, I met Rick Party in like 86, 87, and we went to broadcasting school together. And as if you all have ever listened to Rick Party and his show, when he was here or what he's doing now, he was as thorough back then as a young man. It was probably worse. He was meticulous and very succinct. Everything was on point with him, and it is now too. I learned so much from him back then and he was the best one in in our school he was the best one it wasn't even close and you know i came in trying to do some dumb wacky <laughs> wacky morning radio thing in the evening and it, it failed but i learned um and then rick got me a job in greenville south carolina at whyz to work for this gentleman who i'm going to say his name but i don't say his name often his name's Earl Boston. Yeah, well, uh, 
I will put it this way. I know better and I know how to treat people better because of the way I got treated at WHYZ by that man. And I will never, ever, ever, ever treat a person the way that I got treated. But that's, that's in the, what you said earlier, that's in the book. Um, it didn't work out down there at all. I was back home and I was wandering around, or wandering rather, trying to figure out what I was gonna do. While I was down there, I saw Hakeem Adubuti on television and he was talking about authenticity, et cetera, et cetera. I went to the Jerry Springer show. I hung out with my friend Reggie Gibson, my now friend Reggie Gibson, Ted Witcher, who directed Love Jones. He was finishing Love Jones. He was a page for the Jerry Springer show and a few other folks. I was there with a friend of mine who was on the, on the panel. Reggie goes, hey man, come to Spices. I go to Spices, the first person I see is Hakeem Adubuti when I walk in. I'm like, oh shit, oh, oh. And then the next person I see is Sam Greenlee. I'm like, oh, I'm supposed to be right where I'm at. I started doing poetry. Rick called me, I can't remember how that happened. I, I, was, I was like, man, I wanna come and see you do your thing, see you do your show. He had me come up and I started fooling around with a voice. I know I'm missing stuff. I met first, of course, which was the best thing that ever happened to me because she was boss, always <laughs> the boss. And he's like, he's, you know, hey man, why don't you get on the mic and say something? And I just started talking this crazy talk and I created this thing called Vinny Spinacci and on Rick Party and First Lady's show for about a year maybe, I was the black Italian Vinny Spinacci. And that was when I said to myself, okay, I can quite possibly do this for a living. I think I know how to run a board. I know how radio is supposed to sound. I've been listening to the radio my entire life. And I have all these people I revere and, and, and hold high in esteem. And these two let me have that platform for that little bit of time. And uh, my relationship with GCI lasted for a couple years and I'm, I have not looked back at any of it, and thank you. Because it's really your fault that yeah, all this is happening. That is wonderful. What so, great stories for both of you all. Again, we're going to learn from sort of your trajectory. Um, you know, people think you started out up here because we know what you, you know what you, what you're doing right now. We don't know what happened back then, and that's what we're getting to. Uh, but I'm going to start since we're talking about Chicago and Chicago's influence. We're going to start with you all story at WGCI. You said you were at WGCI. You said you went to WGCI. Give me the story, how you got there, and then how you met Mario. Ah, uh, I, well, it was the challenge to Farley. Why, why weren't there any, you know, women DJs on? And at the time, it wasn't the Hot Mix 5 over there, and I always have to correct him on that because he keeps saying that. It was the Master Mix 6. And, um, he then, uh, Lee Michaels wanted to meet, Lee, Lee Michaels, if it were not for Lee Michaels, there would be no mixers like they are now on the radio. And Lee who Michaels, is Lee Michaels? Give us um, the program director. Um, he's the only program director in history to program one radio station and then go to the other radio station and program and beat himself. You gotta be good to beat yourself. Of course, you know all your own tricks, but still, it's like playing chess with yourself. You can never beat yourself because you know your move, but he, he actually did it. And um, he, he finally went to him and said, hey, I got this young girl, I wanna give her a shot on the air. And he said, yeah, okay. I don't know, I would've wanted more information, but Lee trusted Farley, and um, Farley took me to meet Lee. And that was really my first time seeing the inside of a professional radio station. And I got to see, meet people like Bob Walls, who was doing the morning show at that time. Tom Joyner was, was the afternoon guy. Um, Doug Banks was at BMX. He hadn't even come to GCI yet. Um, Irene Mojica, oh, Irene Mamacita Mojica. Um, Yvonne Daniels, Chili Childs. These were the women that that I was just in awe of because their deliveries were all different, but they all gave of themselves. They were all beautiful. They all carried themselves um, in different ways, but it was all respectful. And the one I ended up closest to, and even now, is Irene, who, who really helped me to understand, you laugh at yourself, 
you talk about your own shortcomings because everybody has them. And if someone says something bad about you, don't worry about it. That's their opinion, don't worry about it. So, so I learned a lot from her. Uh, people like Daryl King, so these women played a big role, but the men played a big role as well because the men were the ones giving me the opportunities. Marv Dyson, who is a, is a legendary uh, radio um, GM, VP, and station owner, only about four foot five inches tall, but believe me, you don't want his foot on your neck or in your back or up your butt, you don't, because he's a big dude. Um, later on, um, I, I had I had left there because I was just I was interning and doing Give me the, the DJing. years on this. I want to make sure this we document was these years. Um, eighty six was when the, the DJing opportunity was eighty six, uh, and so I started interning. Bonnie Deshong helped me with that um, in telling Lee that I was one of her students. So I got to intern and I was interning in programming, and so I got to see how the stage how things were done how they decided what songs were gonna be played, how they decided what the rotation would be, how programming led the station, not sales, because if you don't have anything to sell, you can't sell anything. So programming was really at the tippy tippy top of everything. And I got a chance to be at the number one station, sitting next to all the number one people and getting the information. At 20 years old, you're 20 years old when that's had 1986, how old are you? I, uh, I was 20 years old. Right. right. So at 20 years old, you're probably one of the youngest people rolling around that station there. Yes, I was. And soaking up all of that information. Mm -hmm. So that is just amazing that you were able to do that. Keep going. So you get so there, you're doing that. I, I, um, I got to spend a lot of time just being a fly on the wall for the most part. And I can remember conversations of of um, hearing who was gonna get written up or <laughs> hearing, hearing trouble that Ramonsky Love was in and he wasn't even on the air at the time, he was working in the mail room. <laughs> but, to, but to hear how he was gonna get in trouble because he was late for work and so I, that, that let me know being on time no matter what your position is at the radio station is very, very important. Okay, cool, I got that. Um, being honest with these prizes when they come in, they come in, they're just dumped on your desk and it's up to you to count the swatch watches and decide how many are there to be given away because it doesn't say, well, I want one, maybe I could just, t nobody's gonna miss it. But then to hear about other DJs whose name I won't say because I'm not gonna put them on blast that crawl through no we gotta say the no. names come on now uh -uh. They We're crawl a very quiet group. I'm not this doing that I'm not doing that intimate group here that, but just that one guy I'm not gonna do that to him because his career is going really well and, and I'm you, not gonna, yeah, I'm not gonna it, do that. Yeah. Um but however there was a person that crawled through the uh the ceiling into the prize closet to steal prizes and then was let go yeah so lesson learned leave the swatch watch if you want it just ask for it uh so i learned real pieces of great information <laughs> of things that you don't do um but the biggest thing was to be able to sit in on the music meetings i got to hear barbara prieto talk ask um talk about with the, uh, with the record reps, Frank Chapman, um, uh, John Hall Jr., to talk to them about that record's not gonna work for us. You know, and I didn't really think much of it. Later on, when I, when I came back to GCI, um, working with Rick Party and Elroy Smith was the guy who hired me, and I left out that I worked at 950 AM, which was the first 24-hour rap station in Chicago, and um, along with Pink House and Jay Allen, who is now uh, the program director over at Power 92 and Soul 1063, we started our careers together. Me, him, and Pink House started our real radio careers together. And that was owned by John, John H. Johnson, JPC. Um, and 9.50 a.m., we played 24-hour rap, so we did have to sit and listen to those songs to make sure we were playing the radio versions. If they weren't radio versions, we had to make sure they were edited before they even went into the studio. That's how you stop that from happening, curse words. Uh, that was, let me see, my daughter's born in 91, 93. 93, 94, yeah. Um, so I did that for a year. Uh, then uh, some guys, BPI um, and Associates, which was Barry Mayo, who's another radio giant. Um, Barry Mayo um, is 
Barry Mayo uh, created is 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 credited with creating the format that we now know as Urban AC, which is uh, what V103 is. So. If you guys, if you grew up in Chicago, there was a point where BMX went away and it became V103. It was a tragic moment in my life, so I thought, but it really wasn't. It was a tragic moment for us because we were young and we didn't realize that our parents didn't have anything to listen to and they really didn't want to hear all that bumpity bumpity bump as they say that that we were playing and so v103 came into play the great thing about barry mayo and what i learned from him was the importance of meeting your listener where they are like you talked about knowing who your listener is he would go to george's music room and for anybody who from the west side you know george's music room george is is legendary even in this day for and his record store is not in operation anymore but he was really about the community and he would allow uh barry mayo to come and work his record counter so when you would come up and say, yeah, let me get the this, 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 and this. Then five more people would come up and ask for these same songs. He'd write that down and write it down and know these are the hot songs in the city that I live in. So I, I learned those types of things from him. Um, so they ushered in a 106 Jams, which became the first hip hop and R&B station in Chicago, which is now what Power 92 is and what GCI is. Um, so I did that. Strictly Street Morning Show with Easy Street, um, and uh, got fired. That was my first time getting fired in radio, and you're not in radio if you haven't been fired. I've Lord. Been, I've been, I've been um, told they were going in a different direction three, ta three, four times in my career, and I'm all right with them going in a different direction, because that means I'm going in a different one too. Uh, from there, Elroy had been listening to me on the morning show with, uh, with, um, with, with, with Easy Street. And while he said he wasn't that impressed with Easy Street, he liked the girl that was on with him, which was me. And uh, so at, around this time, I started dating uh, my husband, Hugo H, for the second time, because <laughs> we dated when we were in high school, I mean, when we were 18 and 19, but for the second time. And um, he said to me, don't call me until you've called Elroy to see if he'll hire you. And I was like, so dude, you saying don't call you until I call him to see if he'll hire me for a job? He said, no, what I'm saying is don't call me until you call him to see if he's gonna hire you for this job. And he was like mad serious. First thing he would say is, did you call Elroy? Yeah, did he call you back? No. Okay, but you did call him, yeah. And I could have been lying, but I wasn't because I was like, dang, maybe I should call. Finally, Elroy called me back. He had me on with Rick Party because Cartier, who was wow. Rick Party's producer, he used to be on the air saying, how you doing? How your mom and them doing? He was on vacation, so he had me and Rick come in. Rick and I had been working together already on something called the Increase the Peace Tour, which is where we went into the high schools and we talked, I mean, went into the grammar schools and some high schools and talked to the students about increasing the peace and putting down the guns because hip hop was really going in a different direction. It was going into the bang, bang, shoot them up. So we would go in and that's how we developed our chemistry and our back and forth. So we were grooming ourselves for who we were going to become. So that first day on the air, we were just hitting everything. Bang, 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 because I knew how to finish the end of his sentence because we had already worked together. Doug Banks told Elroy before Doug went um, syndicated, he said, if you don't put these two together, it's gonna be one of the biggest mistakes of your career. Elroy listened to him, thank God. Mm -hmm. He put us together, we became Rick Party and First Lady. To this day, we still have the highest numbers in the six to 10 slot for a male-female duo. Nobody has ever beat us. I don't know why that was. We were just being ourselves. Um, but I also will forever be grateful uh, to my husband for telling me not to call him until I call Elroy to see if he's gonna hire me for this job. Because <laughs> if I would not have done that and he wouldn't have pressed me, I probably would not have pressed myself. Um, so. That is, I remember the day he walked into the studio, there was always somebody coming in the studio, and when he came in, he had this, I, 
I remember his eyes. It was just, his eyes were so, they, they were the first thing that I noticed. I was like, wow, your eyes are amazing. And then he started talking and he was just such a warm person and I immediately took a liking to him. And so Rick was like, good, I'm glad you get along with him because he's gonna come around more. And the Vinny Spinacci thing, um, it, was a, it was wonderful. And he would just come up and he would just get into the conversation. And so that worked. And Rick and I became very much about giving people opportunities whenever we could. Trader Chocolate Jock. He was, our, he was a kid from Lincoln Park High School who called up and said, I want to do radio. And me and Rick were like, okay, we'll come up here. Let's see what you got. We'll let you co-host the, uh, the, the top nine at nine. And he came up and he did it and he did a great job. And now he's somewhere programming a, a radio station. You know, so it was really quasi who used to do, uh, he would always say, live, laugh, love, and learn. Peace and love from GCI, you know? <laughs> anyway, the Chicago Home Jam, any way we could give artists an opportunity. Now here's the interesting thing, those artists were always hip hop artists. Those artists were never house music artists because they never submitted the music. And at this point, this was around, I wanna say 97, 95, 96, 96, yeah, in that era, hip hop was really making a move on Chicago. Yeah. And I say they were making a move on Chicago because that's what they did. They made a move on us and, and house music didn't stand up and fight back. And that's gonna always be where I'm pissed because it was ours, we created it, it came from us and we didn't fight for it, we willingly gave it away. Here in Chicago, we willingly gave it away and just, for whatever reason. Um, and so we did play house music. The mixes still supported it. Uh, uh, Armando Rivera still did Club 107.5. You know, we still had the, the mixes that played um, uh, at five o'clock, you know, and it was still house music driven, but there was none in regular rotation besides Follow Me by Elias. If I never hear that again, it's okay. <laughs> But we play it on Jam 98. <laughs> you you going to hear it today. <laughs> jam. You jinxed yeah. yourself. So house music, house music started taking a background, and we noticed that the songs that had been provided for us uh, to put into the top nine at nine were uh, artists like, you know, of course, R. Kelly, um, Crucial Conflict. We started to get Twista, Common, you know, so uh, Alicia Keys would start. So we would start to, well, she was a little later on, but still, she, that era of hip hop and R&B, and there was no house music. Then all of a sudden, you'd get a CeCe Peniston in there, which is cool, but she's not from here. So it was like, why didn't we hear more Shantae Savage? You know, Teresa Griffin hadn't really busted onto the scene yet, but we didn't hear any of that. It was all hip hop, which I was kind of okay with because it was Chicago hip hop. But the house music part went away. And when you have program directors, and as much as I love and revere Elroy Smith, he's not from Chicago. So he was not, he wasn't like Lee Michaels, who understood what house music meant to us, what dance music meant to us, what disco meant to us. So, and, so nobody pushed for it. So it went away. And no other stations were promoting it. Uh, 106 Jams was strictly hip hop and R&B. So we disappeared into the college format. Yeah, which is, you know, it's a tragedy. Uh, we just had a quick conversation on the show with Kelly G, who mm -hmm. is, you know, Chicago, who is WGCI, who knows house music. And you get to DC at BET and house music disappears. So we're like, where's your influence mm -hmm. with all these other things? But Mario, talk to me about jumping into the meeting Rick Party. How did you get there? How did you end up rolling into the station and meeting? I've known Rick for years. I had already known him and he helped me get that gig in South Carolina. And when I came back up, I was trying to like really just figure out what I was going to do. Um, and I, I think the, I think he figured it out before anyone else figured it out, that if you concentrate on what's happening in Chicago, on this Chicago radio station, with all this talent in Chicago and in the surrounding suburbs and stuff, there's enough, more than enough talent here to supplant any talent from anywhere else in the world. It is a fact, it is a documented fact, it has been proven in every genre of music ever 
Chicago is the planet, always has been. And I think his saying, let me put this dude on here, because I know him and I know he's not going to mess this up. He knew he knew enough about me to know how much I respected it. And so <laughs> Rick and first let me break a record. I don't even know if you remember this. Prime not Prime Ready. Um Rubber Room. The first time body snatching got played any place was on WGCI. I talked to Rick. I was like I was like, "Man, I have a record I want you to play." Cause he was doing this thing where he was playing records from people in Chicago, the home jam. And I, I'm like, I got a record. <laughs> he's like, you do. And it's Rick. So he's all the voice is deeper than he, he's about this big, but he's, you do. I'm like, yeah. And he goes, well, what is it? And I said, it's rubber room. And it turns out the night that we played that I think Michael Finley was in the station that night. So two things happened that night. And then I'll finish answering your question. So Michael Finley is in there, and I'm doing Vinny Spinacci, and I ask him in my Vinny Spinacci voice, I go, yeah, so uh, Dennis Rodman, when you're running down the court, does he, do, you know, stink? And Michael Finley turns around and looks at me like, what the, who is, what is, and we moved on. And then we played that record. We played Body Snatching by Rubber Room, Metamor, Rest in Peace. And that was the first time that record got played in Chicago, and it was the first time Rubber Room ever got played on WGCI, and it meant something because they were from the area, and it was important. Um, so me going into GCI, I knew I had to hold it down for me so I could get asked back one day for anything. Um, and I ended up being back in there with, um, with uh, I almost called him by his real name, George, with uh, Mike Love and the Diz. And continuing to do Vinny Spinacci and doing it on Crazy Howard and doing it again with Easy, and uh, and first, and um, my thing was always the reverence I had for WGCI. Having listened to Bob Wall, having listened, Doug Banks was my hero. That was my dude. Like, if anything that I'm doing now, I am doing in my mind the most succinct and direct impression of Doug Banks that I could possibly do. Because he, for me, represented everything that made radio good. How he delivered, how he set the show up, how he had a cast, and how he brought all of them into it. If you listen to GCI back then when Doug was on doing mornings, it wouldn't be him in that first half hour. He'd have Harold Rush do the first half hour. It would be Rush and maybe one other person. He, he, he does the intro. It's like a, it was like a setting a, a plate, if you will. Or setting a table, Rush sets the table, Doug comes on around six and he's on. And he would have these characters, 805 guy. It's like still one of the funniest things I've ever heard on the radio in my life. Miss Leonard, all that stuff. The way the shows were structured gave me the presence of mind to know this is how it should sound. It should be entertaining and I should be I should be almost late for school because I'm listening to Doug. And it happened more than once that I almost missed a class or two messing around with them. Um, so when I walked in, I already knew who everyone was. I knew who Elroy Smith was. I knew who every DJ was. Um, and I, I was like, you are here. There is no warming up to get here. You here. Don't F up. Don't. You know, I wasn't getting paid, so they couldn't fire me, which was great because I would be like, what? Would you go fire me? Go ahead. Um, and then we'd have the Moo and Oink day when Dwayne Way's dad would have. So Moo and Oink would come and bring food to GCI. Look, let me tell you about food, right? It was the dumbest experience ever because there would be so much food. It was like, it, would be, it was a room. So the, imagine you walk into GCI, you go straight ahead, it's the studios, but if you hang a little bit of a left, there's this room. And in this room, it's a, it was the kitchen. And it's, you can barely get in the room, it's food. And it's so much food that when I walked in, I'm, you know, I'm starving. I'm not even thinking about Moon Oink Day, but I knew when it was, and I made sure that I did my hit every time it was Moon Oink Day at GCI so I could eat something. But I, I, my reverence for WGCI and for just Chicago radio made it so that I knew when I walked in, I was not going to be the one 
ask not to come back. I, I, I respect it too much to do that. Got it. So, you know, this, this panel is, is discussing the foundations. And so we're talking about R&B, soul, and house music via radio mixes. And Chrissy, you talked a little bit about that, like how house music somehow disappeared from our airwaves across the board. I mean, there were little, there's an hour mix here, there's this and that, that kind of thing. Do you think it was, first of all, what were you all playing? What was on your playlist at that time? What were you all playing back when you all were on the radio? Well, it was it was it was hip hop and R it was hip hop and R and B. Who um, are the artists? Give me some of those um, artists that okay, you all were so playing. Okay, so the nineties. So you oh. have you have R Kelly. That was the nineties. I'll so be sure. I'll maybe. be sure. You had uh, Mary, Mary J. Mary J. Um, let's see who else. Uh, uh, Jodeci. Jo- oh, uh, um, um, H Town. H Town. Um, uh, um, let's see who else was some of the really. Uh, Big ones, Boys to Men, yeah. had had come into play. Uh, New Edition was still still rolling at that point. Of course, Bobby Brown. Um, Anything from Diddy's people? Yeah. Uh, in the beginning part of that. Uh, occasionally, we get a Tupac in there every once in a while, you know. But um, never any N.W.A. was, you know, that was on rap radio. That never re- that never made it to G.C.I. But Ice Cube, most definitely Ice T. Absolutely never. Um, right. <laughs> although I would have loved to play so icy, but no, you know, Yo Yo, uh, Queen Latifah, you know, so these these staples in hip hop, LL Cool J, these staples you definitely heard. Um, God, you would still hear a little sprinkle of uh, of a Shaka Khan song if it was I Am Every Woman, and it would generally be if it was something special happening, you know, you it would, but real. I don't want to say real artistry, um, real, to me that was just, that was the, that was radio with, with music and, and what you had to choose from. Because at one point, um, DJs like, in, when Herb was starting out and in the VON days, you'd go in and there'd just be this wall of, of vinyl. And of course you could bring your own, but this wall of vinyl, and you would go in and you would select what songs you wanted to play, and you'd put them, you'd line them up on the turntable, and then you'd play them, you know. Um, as programming came into play, as corporate came into play, and because of payola, owners and, and programmers and, and stuff, they wanted to get more control over stopping a DJ from telling a local artist, give me $5,000 and I'm gonna play your song every day that I'm on, 10 times a day. Like you said, you heard Whitney Houston at the top of the hour, at the quarter hour, at the bottom of the hour. I almost left. So that, that put the kibosh on that when programming came into play, more, more structure. Um, so, but you, there was so much great music. And, and so for, for us, for Jam 98, we wanted to bring that back where you would hear great music because like Hugo says, nobody says that's my hit. They say that's my jam. And corporate made hits. <laughs> we make jams. If I say, give me your favorite uh, Shaka Khan song or Rufus song, you, you may say, ooh, ooh, Everlasting Love, that was my jam. You don't say Everlasting Love, that was my hit. <laughs> Oh my God, that was the hit there. Nah, you would say that's my jam, that's my joint, that's my cut, but you don't say that's my hit. And so, uh, what happened start saying was that's my in, hit. as the '90s came in, the music that we were playing were hits. Hence, GCI, we play the hits. Man. We that's all we play is the hits. We don't play a damn jam, but we play, <laughs> we the, play hits. the hits. <laughs> that's right. They ain't playing no jams, but they'll play plenty there of hits. Were times when Rick and I would, and I can't recall the <laughs> actual song, but it was it was one song that that we would play, and it might not have been me and Rick. It might have been me when I was by myself um, doing the the, the uh, whispers in the dark. And I was like, "What in the entire hell is this? Why are we playing this song? This is so this is horrible." But it was a hit because they said it was a hit, and that. It, it just didn't sit right with, with me. But I needed to keep my lights on and I needed to pay my bills. So I shut up and I did what I was supposed to do and like any other radio personality uh, that wanted to pay their bills. 
And I kept in the back of my mind when it became my time to program, when it became my time to sit at the head of the table and decide what was gonna be on the menu, I was going to choose differently. And I didn't get a chance to do that until I got to Indianapolis. Um, with, uh, and it wasn't with an R&B station. It wasn't with a, it was with the gospel station. And I was, Hugo and I were having a conversation and I said, you know, why don't we put mixes on a gospel station? And this was in maybe 2008, nine, something like that. And I didn't know any gospel DJs. So I, at, at that time, so yeah, I, at that time, yeah, you're I, way ahead of your time. I said, Chrissy. Hugo, could you just do some gospel mixes? He said, okay, but you need to give me the music that you want me to play so I can stay within the realm. Cause you really do when you want to change the game, you can't just bust out busting windows. You have to kind of like key the car a little bit and you know, so that they don't really notice it. And so, uh, I went to the station, I got all these CDs and I brought them back to the house and I said, here, he went through every CD, every freaking song. He went through to decide what was mixable, what was good, what was palatable. It didn't matter if it was a hit, it was how it sounded to, to his ear. And then I just trusted him and it was very good. So at, at um, what happened was we called it new school, same church, sa new church, I'm sorry, new church, same Jesus, new church, okay? Um, and so when I got a call from whoever was in charge of uh, the gospel format at Radio One at the time asking me why I was doing it, I said, because you don't just start loving the Lord at 35. And we needed to provide something different than what our hip hop carnal part was providing. So we started, he, he started ushering in playing a holy hip hop and then the mixes were being mixed like we do house mixes. So he was beating these hip, these holy hip hop songs, taking the bass out and tweaking it here and dropping this. And then he would say, I'm gonna take this acapella and I'm gonna ride it behind a house track. So now I'm getting an opportunity to introduce not just another city to our music, but also a different genre which is actually a part of house music, that spiritual part. But I got an opportunity to do that, to make that change. Then all of a sudden I noticed the other inspirational stations, now all of a sudden they, they run in mixes. I'm like, well, oh really? So now you biting my stuff? You couldn't come up with your own ideas? But it was a good thing because it gave an opportunity for a whole new genre of music, holy hip hop, to get to get heard. And Radio One is still, which is now Urban One, they're still running that, that format. And I take pride in knowing that it was just an idea from a conversation we were having at the table, you know. But doing things like that, because I knew on TLC FM, even I was assistant program director, I couldn't convince the program director to take the hit by playing some house music. So he stayed safe. When you stay safe, you stay safe. Nothing changes. And so I said to Hugo, who's my go-to for everything, hey, man, can you, I need some music beds. I need some house music beds, but not two house music that somebody would say. So he played it safe for, in the beginning. He gave me some, some tracks, you know, familiar, you know, familiar house songs. Then there were other, you know, they ushered in some other songs, and I just talked over them. So they became my music beds. And that was my way of being a, a rebel. And, and, and it was like he in the car, because he didn't even catch it, you know? But even now, uh, we're still fighting to get more of a house music presence um, into other cities like Indianapolis and um, uh, uh, St. Louis and other places like that because radio will not support it. But let me just say this before um, we go on. Digital streaming radio, and you brought this up, it is such a powerful thing. You do not have to keep going to GCI, Power 92. So you, if they're not giving you what you want, turn them off. Pick up your phone and look on social media or just download different apps and doesn't have to be Pandora or Spotify because that is slighted too sometimes. But the thing about digital streaming radio and apps is you make the choice to make that a part of your life. 
So when you when you download it, you're making a choice. When you push it in the morning or in the afternoon and, and the music comes on and you're listening, you're making a choice. And you're letting people know, you're letting these big corporate people know that uh, we're tired as hell and we're not going to put up with your stuff telling us what we like and what we need. And also, it's more of an opportunity to control your own narrative without somebody telling you you're going to be kicked off the campus. And, and I would say to you, I would encourage um, you and the uh, Vintage House Show, um, I encourage what you're doing, and I hope that you will eventually move off of NUR and move into a format where you can do whatever you want, whenever you want, the way you want. And I am so willing to help you in that area. Well, you just said a word because we about to be right over there at Jam 98. Don't even play. <laughs> and, 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 as well as, uh, let me just tell you this one more. I know y'all like, dang. Um, there's a new uh, female-owned uh, television network called Beast Fire TV. It's on Re Roku and Amazon Fire TV. I convinced her to do a house music channel. And she said, well, if you're going to do a house music channel, then uh, you and Hugo need to do the programming. No problem. <laughs> no problem. So we went out and we got... I started reaching out, and he started reaching out to DJs that we knew and said, hey, send me a mix with a cue sheet. DJs hate cue sheets because that's their playlist uh, with the cue sheet and some photos. Now, when you, at, when you give somebody an opportunity, somebody offers you an opportunity, if you don't want to do it, just say no, okay? The DJs that did send, DJ Alicia sent, Hugo did, I did, and a lady from Spain uh, named Nita Funk. So when you turn on the channel, it is our four mixes that you see. And I am still waiting for some of these DJs to do it. But what it opens up is it could be a place that Vintage House Show could live. It could be another place that this program could be shown. And so, again, I'm willing to make the connection with the network owner so that that opportunity is there for, for you guys. And where you go with it from there... It's up to you. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. That's exactly what First we want to do. First out here handing out jobs. And I stuff. know, exactly. Because <laughs> now we're going to talk about the future because that's basically what you're saying, and, and we want to do that. Mario, we know that you have a radio show. You've got two podcasts. Talk to me about these three entities and why you decided to do that, why that was important to you at this time. Because the radio sucks, and I wasn't going to be part of nothing that was bad. So I used to work for an organization called Guild Complex many years ago. And um, the best thing that ever happened to me, best job I've ever had, ever. It was the best job I ever had. Michael Ward was my uh, inspiration to do a lot of the stuff that I'm doing now. I walked into a, I, I, it will all fit, I promise. I walked into the note in Wicker Park. I had a few. There was a panel discussion about how the reader had censored Ice Cube, and I was hot about that. I'm like, this is not going to play. We went in there, and I said something. I can't even remember what I said, and Michael Ward goes, hey, I want you to come and see me tomorrow, and he gave me a job. So I worked for the complex for a while, and then I got fired. And the week before I got fired, Martin Nicholas at WHPK had been she had been asking me while I was working at the complex toward the end of my complex career if I wanted to have a show at WHPK and now I've done the Rick Party stuff done the GCI stuff I've been in that world and I've I'm as much as I am in reverence of it I'm also listening and it's the same the only thing that was different and that had any kind of glow on it were the people who were introducing the same records all the time. So I was like, okay, the personality part I get, the music is horrible. And it wasn't that the music itself was bad, but too much of anything is not good for you, right? I get fired. Oh God, it was such a horrible day. I get fired, I go home, and I start writing essays called News from the Service Entrance. And I was writing them over the service entrance of my building on, on Kenwood. And I was like, that's the name, News from the Service Entrance. So I'm writing these essays and I'm sending them to my friends just so I can keep my pen sharp and keep my mind moving and not be so upset about how the hell am I going to pay my rent because that was rough. June 2001, 
WHPK hits me back and is like, do you want to start a show? And I'm like, when? <laughs> like next week. I'm like, word, I'm there. So originally this show was supposed to be myself, Krista Franklin, and Kevin Cobalt. And it was going to be like 60 minutes on the radio. And we were going to do these reports from the field. Nah, nah, nah. Kevin and Krista never showed up. And they haven't shown their asses up since. So it's been me for 22 years. And I said I wanted to have a combination of everything that I've ever liked about the radio in one package. I wanted to play whatever I wanted. And I played anything that I liked. It didn't matter who made it. If I liked it, I knew one other person in the world would like it. So my show, my playlist could be, good Lord, it could be like Flora Purim, Johnny Cash, P.E., uh, a mix from Ron Hardy that I have on a cassette from somebody I got a million years. Any, It could be anything. I'd never wanted to limit my audience to a certain genre of music because that is not how human beings work. We think on different levels and we always have room to expand the level that we're thinking on. It's like being in a parking garage almost. You keep going up, there's more cars, there's more room to park, hopefully, unless you live in Hyde Park. There's more room to park um, and there's this expansion in thought, right? Um, so I've been doing news from the service entrance all this time with the sole intention of having it be a honestly a black man's point of view about world events with this banging music that everybody could listen to i draw you in with the music i say my piece there i started really incorporating the interviews maybe the third or fourth year of news from the service interest and i started like getting people i'm george clinton to live quali dr margaret burroughs uh, just all these people are renowned, right? And, yes. You ha do you have the tape of you uh, well, Burroughs, my hero, Shiro? You know, the way relationships work, um, a lot of those shows are in the garbage dump, unfortunately. I have a great interview with Herb Kent that's gone. Patrice Russian, gone. So a lot of them are gone, but I have a lot of them that aren't. Um, that's a lesson to be learned. Archive everything, <laughs> everything. Um, but the interviews started really getting better, and they started improving, and I could tell they were improving because when I would ask a question, the, the, the response, man, that's a good question. And the more I heard, I'm like, damn, am I actually asking good questions or are they just being nice? And I kept hearing them go, okay, these are good questions. And I kind of... I had it in my mind, I wanted to expand that. I have a conversation with Eric Williams from Silver Room, and we're talking about doing Silver Room radio. I'm like, dude, you're killing it with Block Party. The store is killing it. It's a movement happening. We need to have some kind of radio presence. It could be a low power radio station. You don't need a lot to do that. You really need more than anything, the equipment. Those licenses are far easier to get, and they don't cost a third of the amount of money. Eric, being Eric, is like, that's a great idea. Four years later, he goes, look, I'm doing Silver Room Digital. I want to have a podcast. And that four years ended with it being right in the middle of COVID. He's like, I'm going to start up. <laughs> it took COVID to make it happen. It's weird. And we start doing Randomly Selected. And it was really just to keep in touch with the people who were patronizing the store but the store had been closed and keeping the artists in tune with what other artists were doing keeping everybody kind of on the same page like we're alive everybody's good everybody eating do you need anything that kind of thing and randomly selected we will be broadcasting our 50th episode uh with scoop jackson uh it should be like monday or tuesday um you wherever a podcast is available on the planet randomly selected powered by the silver room yeah um here we are see this is what i mean you handing out jobs um and the other podcast who you got with mike and mario <laughs> my friend michael lockett who is in one of the best bands ever called ascendant was doing this thing on facebook oh look at that that's nice isn't it 
It's, it's sharp and clean. Um, who you got with Mike and Mario? So Mike O'Lockett, Mike, was on Facebook doing these Battle of the Best. Shaka Khan versus Spillis Hyman. Blah, blah, blah. And I would always send these memes to him that were just very disrespectful and mean. Because I'm like, how are you going to, how are you putting them together? You can't, that's not fair. Very much in the spirit of that man, Herb Kent, these things started to gain traction on Facebook, like traction, traction. And he called me one day and he goes, hey man, I want to do a podcast. And my matter of fact brain, I'm like, sure man, all you need is like two mics. Um, you know, you can record over a computer and then get a logo. And so <laughs> it's who you got with Mike and Mario. We have done, I think we're on our hundredth episode. Um, they're once a week, same deal, wherever you get podcasts. And as much as we try to really make it about the music, it, it's absolutely not about the music at all. It's about me and him clowning, clowning each other, um, talking about stuff. It's a really fun show, and it's like 40 minutes maybe. And I swear to God, we have tried to do just like come in and start the show and be like, okay, man, here's this song, here's that song. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. And it ends up we have a conversation about um, anything. It's such a cool show. So who you got with Mike and Mario? Yeah. But it, it none of that happens if, <laughs> if I don't get fired from my job. None of this happens if I don't get let go. So. Exactly. Chrissy, you are now doing sort of Jam 98 Music for the Soul. And when we, we saw each other recently, you were saying that like, you're going to be playing music that no one else is playing. Talk to me about creating this, you know, producing this. Why is that important to you as we sort of think about the history and the future of radio? Well, um, you know the saying, and I think somebody said in the earlier this in earlier in the discussion that you learn everything on somebody else's dime, make all your mistakes on their dime, and then you strike out on your own. You already know what not to do. Hence, you know how you're not going to treat people because of the way you were treated. So, from a programming end, I already knew um, that if there was going to be a station if we were gonna start a station, I already knew what I wanted the structure to be. Uh, structure is not the word to say to my partner, my husband, who as a DJ, DJs deal in a different world of structure. Um, from programming, we deal in a, in a, here's the menu, here's how it's gonna roll. So th when people say husband and wives can't work together, it's because they don't know how to separate the husband and wife from the working together. So at any given time in our house, you'll hear, I love you, I love you. No, that's not, why are we doing that though? That doesn't make any sense. That's not, that's not, would you, okay, all right, okay. You know, so you have to divide. So how we divide is I do the programming part and he does the music part because I know, I know my strength, that's his strength. And um, so I, we try not to cross over into each other's lanes. So the thought, but we, did, we do have conversations about it. So we, uh, on the way here, we were having a conversation about two songs that played back to back. Uh, one was House, one was Straight House, and the other one was House E. And then the other one that came on was Disco. And so we're both listening, we're going, well, should that have happened? Yeah, sure, why not? It sounded good, Every, it was a jam, the three jams back to back, everybody's head's nodding, that's what's important. But we had the conversation, whereas, um, but how it's formatted is that first song was from the 70s or from the 80s. The other song was from the, from the 2000s and the other song was from the 70s. So from the programming end, the sound is correct it, because you're playing from eras. Uh, the fact that now we could break it down more and make it, um, you know, 80s, 2000s, 70s, R&B, hip hop, house, if we wanted to. And sometimes it, it, it plays like that because like, like in a restaurant, you can say what you're going to have, um, what, you're gonna, what you're gonna provide in the restaurant and then you go about uh, putting the menu together and then you tweak the menu. Okay, Th and this is going to be our specials, and this is going to be this, and so that's what we that's what we do. And so, I understand that the magic happens in between the music. The music is the star. M in radio, music is always the star. 
the magical part that keeps you listening, because anybody can play Barry White. Any radio station can play uh, Teresa Griffin, wonderful, anyone. But what happens with the transition between Barry White and Teresa Griffin is what keeps you listening to a station. And so that's where we had to think about who do we want to have on the air. And so, um, of course, I, I started myself, you know, because if you're not going to invest in you, who is? So um, I started, we started with a mix. So we have a mix, uh, the, the, the lunchtime jam that, that Hugo does. Now, I don't talk through the mix because it's respect. You're listening to the music. You don't need to hear me go, that's my man, Hugo H. He put it down. Woo! You don't need to do that because you don't need to hear me do that because that's what you should be doing, you know? Uh, and so the, the mix plays. And so he said, I want to do a Steppers, and, uh, a Steppers and Walkers mix because all throughout the week, Friday is definitely a uh, house mix. But Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday is a mix of house, disco, you know, R&B. It could be a little bit of, of, of up-tempo jazz. And... Um, Wednesday is about the steppers and the walkers. So we made the decision to provide something for everybody, the way radio used to be and the way it should be. When you, it's like a grocery store. It's something in there for everybody. You know, whether you're vegan or vegetarian or you just a real hardcore meat eater, there's something for everybody. And so that's uh, what we thought to do. And not only that, um, I, I'm not a big fan. I mean, I'm not, not a big fan, but I don't know a lot about soft rock or classic rock, but he does. So when he came, when he, when he sent me the music and it was, I started to see, you know, I know who the Beatles are. I know who the Rolling Stones are, but I started to see some of these others. I'm like, who is that? Mm. I don't know who that is. And he said, don't worry about it. Trust me, it's a jam. Yacht Rock is what's up. I yeah, mean, you got well, we had that conversation. Right. And, and, and then they, I said, oh yeah. The Little River Band. Yeah, I know that. Oh, yeah. Hear that fucking sound. You know, that, whatever. I just, I'm like, man, I know that that's that song. Music, that's the part where the, if the music is good. Exactly. Let the damn music play. Because it was a jam. So I constantly have to come out of that corporatized programming structure that I was it was inundated in me. And so now it's more of a, is of a free flow back to, back to your roots, if you will. And that's been the beauty of the station. The other thing is uh, Bonnie DeShong does her show, and it's more of a lifestyle show, so she talks and does interviews, but she plays music in between. So we allow her to play, to choose her own music to play. Will Downing is also on our station, um, and there are not a lot of artists who are really good personalities. Will Downing, I told him, you, you could stop singing if you want to and make this a real career because not only does he have a voice, he has a voice that not only women love, but men can enjoy because he sounds like a man. He's not talking like this and you got to wonder. You know, he sounds like a man. He talks about man things, you know. Um, and so we, we take his show. It's a one-hour show. It's Sunday through Thursday at 9 p.m. And he picks his music and it's like you said. He doesn't worry about if it's a hit or whatever, if it, if it sounds good to him. And I don't think there's ever been a, a time that we put his show on and was like, what the hell is he playing? Let's, I should have listened to that first B because he, he knows good music. We also have Angela Stribling on who was from BET who used to do screen scenes. She was there were two, two distinct women on BET in the beginning. It was Sherry Carter and Angela Stribling. Sherry Carter was fair, fairer complected Angela Stribling was a was a little was a brown sister, both beautiful. Sherry Carter is not really interested in doing radio right now. I I tried to push the issue, but she's not. Angela Stribling does Pillow Talk with Angela, which is a love love show more or less in relationships. Her show comes on after Will Downing on Sunday nights. Now the interesting thing that we decided to do with her was not take her music. So it's a show about love and relationship, but you're gonna hear up tempo music. Why? Because up-tempo music can be about relationships and love and good times, too. So it's a different twist on what would be considered a whispers in the dark kind of format. So again, um, we just sat down and started talking about the best parts of radio and what's missing on the airwaves and started piecing that together, piecing that type of thing together. We try to stay away from a lot of politics and um, uh, uh, side 
woo woo for myself um, this year. Myself, along with 38 other black women, were um, inducted into the United States Library of Congress for Black Women in Radio, which is, a, which is a, thank you, which is a huge thing because earned the U.S. Library of Congress ain't think about black people. So <laughs> that was my Kanye West <laughs> moment right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so they so so this was um, this was an awesome moment because it's a living document. So I get to put in there my life as a wife, as a mother, as um, as a DJ, as somebody that was at the beginning of house music, that was at the beginning of Chicago hip hop, that's in radio, uh, that has um, been an author. You know, the poster from the first. Um, uh, um, event that we did with the female DJs, that, that a picture of that is in the Library of Congress because it is a part of my history. So it also gives me an opportunity to put other people in the Library of Congress as well. And when, and when people see it from, from, from me, they can Google it and find out about, about what you're doing. And so that's a, great, that's a great moment. But for me, going in and being the only one sitting at the table that actually controlled the narrative of what was going yeah. on over the radio airwaves without question, without anybody coming back and sending me a memo saying, see, see me regarding talking about this, that, and the other, or playing this song. It was a very liberating um, um, feeling. And so as a result of us sitting there, they made us um, all, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, U.S. Press, uh, gave us U.S. Press uh, access. So I get to interview the, de the, the uh, head of the Department of Education and public engagement and stuff like that. Haven't gotten to the president yet or the vice president, but um, working my way around the White House. And, th and that's, an, that's an awesome thing because through that, I get to talk about house music. <laughs> that is amazing, Chrissy. That Would is you so wonderful. You wouldn't believe it, but house music, it exists in D.C., not does, more than Go-Go. Sure. Right. Go-Go Go -Go never went away it, yeah. on the airwaves of D.C. because they stand up and support their stuff. But because, because of Howard University yeah. and people coming from the, the Chicago or from New York or New Jersey and coming there, they're bringing their music with them, and that music is house music, and it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. you know. But they, I wish we would have... St stood ten toes to the ground on house music around here. I know we can bring it back though. Let's talk about your archives. Did, did you all send some archives to uh, to I the did. team here? I Let's talk about these things. I think Chrissy got more. I was going to say too. If you listen to the radio in D.C., Go Go is king. Yep. It. I don't care what they're doing. Go Go is king. Yeah. Go Go is king though. If 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 they did house music like that here, it, it it would be a marked difference in how the radio in Chicago sounds. Oh, so that's the billboard for my show. Um, I gotta say, after the whole HPK debacle with the imaginary, oh, I don't even want to go into it. Um, um, being at Lumpin Radio has been the best thing that has happened to me so far. I. I appreciate that they respect my voice. And when we had, when George Floyd was murdered in the middle of COVID, nobody was at our station. We were doing shows from home. They called me and was like, yo, you got to come down here. We have to do a show and we have to do it from here. And so we are all in the studio as pictures. I wish I'd have had one of those. Um, we all got masks on. We're talking to people from Minneapolis. We're talking to people from down south. We just had a network of people on that day talking about how they felt, what had happened, trying to get some historical precedence about what happened. Um, and Lumpen Radio has been very good about letting me do my thing and not me having to, it's a station full of, of, of people, Latino people, white people, and black folks, and I do my thing, and I'm very happy. I I gotta say, man, they they did well for me. I'm I'm super proud, and they letting me do this stupid show still. So, um, yeah, and we'll be going on year twenty something. Ah, oh, it's blurry, but that's my man. So this is the day that Herb tried to kill us at V103. Um, 
I got to say, man, uh, that dude <laughs> was very clever. His rate, if you ever get a chance to read the book, Cool Gent, read it. He was he was doing it all. The the electric crazy people, um, him showing up, just showing up, just showing up, being Herb Kent. I mean, it's not just the cowboy hat and the stepper stuff. He is the architect of Chicago radio, like for real. It's only him and Dick Biondi. And I guess you could say like Bernadine C. Washington and Yvonne Daniels, just that canon of radio DJs, man, and how they formed it. But that dude, that's the the man, period. All conversations about Chicago radio for me begin to end with her. And um, just trying not to screw it up for my man, because again, he will walk up on you. I'm so afraid. Put it to you this way. My sister, before she passed away, told me, look, you always walk on the street side if you're with a young lady. If I see you doing otherwise, I'm going to come up and I'm going to hit you in the back of your head. <laughs> before this man passed away, he made it a point where he saw, I don't know, he just liked abusing me, I think. He liked abusing everybody. Yeah. I don't know, because it seemed like he would be nice to everybody. He'd be, hey, Mario, how you doing? Wow. And then hit me in the back of the head. But um, I loved him. And uh, I am very, very... I'm humbled that I even had a chance to meet somebody like that. So, yeah. Aside from him trying to make me watch his car, which I did. Um, Herb Kent is the greatest. The absolute greatest. And I think that's all my stuff. They're recording, Chrissy. They're recording. Sorry. Um, WCSU, that's Chicago State University, um, that was, we had the idea to, to get a radio station going because I had come from KKC and I just could not imagine a, ra a college with a predominantly black college with no radio voice. What's going on here? Especially, yeah, so um, this was 95 and we started the radio station. I was the first program director. And the crazy thing about it is the first two shows happened and then I got hired at GCI. So I, I, I had to quit. Um, but that moment is frozen in my memory of when I look at it now from where I'm standing now. And, and you know how you have a moment where you say, I was destined to be where I am not right now? Uh, Chrissy, I just want to go back a little bit. I mean, not everyone can say, you know what? Uh, we need a radio presence, and it happens. Okay, so well, talk to us about well, how I that wasn't, occurred. I wasn't the only one. It was just that we had a radio and television program, but it was under speech, which was under English. And, and Kanye West's um, mother, Dr. Donda West, was um, the head of the department. And I figure, since I, you know, could just walk into the department chair's office and say, hey, I got an idea, why not do it? But what I didn't know was that there were other students that wanted to do it as well. And it wasn't the first time that they were hearing that they wanted a radio station. And uh, the um, Dr. Christine Liss, who's still there, um, who is now the department chair, she was my instructor and she said, we're gonna make it happen. And they started working on it. Of course, as students, we really couldn't do anything. My job was to create the programming and to get the music. And so that's, that's, that's what I did at that point. Um, and I look at it now. Now Troy Tyler is over there running the station. And uh, when I told Troy, you know, if you look at the archive, I was the first program director. And she's like, get out of here. You know, so um, it's just an awesome moment uh, to see and I wonder where some of those people are if they continued in radio or not you know sometimes after you get fired you just say well hi welcome to Walmart hi man hi, listen, welcome to Burger King may I take your order please look, you know they just forget about it not but. me player mm -mm. so uh, Wednesday uh, it was January 26 it was the first anniversary party at Sawyer's or Sours um, for uh, Park Avenue Promotions. Year? And, what year was that? Uh, oh, shoot. I don't even know. It was... Um, it was I, yeah, it was in the 80s. It ha maybe it was 87. Had to be like 87, something like that. And uh, it's a fantastic four. 
uh, Celeste, Kenya, myself, I went by Chrissy Hot Mix Henderson, and Bird, who is uh, Berlando Drake, who, funny thing is, she's, now Kenya and Bird are from the west side, me and Celeste from the south side, but Bird um, is Hugo's cousin. And so Bird and I were DJing together. I had no idea that that was her cousin. And then years later, I met him through Tyree Cooper. We started dating, then we broke up. And then we got back together, we got married, and here we are. And now Bird's my cousin, you know? It's like, wow, how things play out. Uh, Celeste and I um, are, are still friends. Kenya is um, a assistant provost at, um, I forgot what university, on the East Coast. And Bird is still singing, uh, and she's still, uh, on the West Coast. So we're trying to do, I'm, I'm really trying to put together, maybe you can help me with it, a street sign for the Fantastic Four because we deserve one. Because before there was a Super Jane, before there was um, any of these other all-female teams, it was a Fantastic Four. And so <laughs> we, get, we, get, we get overlooked because we didn't have marketing. We didn't have, um, we didn't have branding behind us. We just had these guys from Park Avenue Promotion put it these posters early. up. It was early. That was very was early in the ballgame. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so uh, that was that, the, the Fantastic Four. So, so this one is the new uh, old school versus new school. I told you Mario was going to get a kick out of this one. Now, the funny thing about this is um, you got the godfather of house. By then, he had transitioned his name from Farley Funk and Keefe to Farley Jackmaster Funk. Um, the $2,000 dance competition, I cannot even begin to tell you who won. <coughs> and it was at the Click, which was originally La Mirage, which then became E2, which is now nothing. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and it was hosted by me and Rick and Howard. And Rick and Howard, their relationship, hip, how, <laughs> Go ahead. Howard just he he was originally he did beeper commercials. And um I remember him telling me I would never make it in radio when when I was at KKC. <laughs> anywho. And then he had to come to you. Anywho. <laughs> as I move on, um but he couldn't get the numbers that me and Rick got. He couldn't get the response from people that, that, that we got. And I think that kind of bugged him a little bit, and I think it still does, but whatever. And so that's, they have the two of them duking it out, and it's funny because that's, that's a cutout picture. I mean, one of my favorite pictures of myself. That was from 95, I remember, because of the picture. Uh, and I actually have my hand on Rick's shoulder, <laughs> but they cut it off. You know, and and so and that's Rick's head from that picture, and and um, Howard's head from our promotional picture. So they they were doing cut off graphics way before Canva. You know, you know, it's probably this Photoshop. You know, Chris, it's probably more truth than them wanting to fight than this yeah, picture. Yeah, yeah. And then that's like, yeah, you had legend, the legendary DJs for the old school. You had Hugo, you had Paul Johnson. Mm. Rest I in peace. Then you got the new school, DJ Milton, DJ Dion. So, um, yeah, and so uh, that was really interesting. And it was, an op it was really one of those moments where GCI did step out and support house music. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, so SG1 Ooh, House team. is, um, um, we were in Amsterdam in 2015, and uh, we met a young lady. Uh, we were sitting having dinner with uh, with a producer named uh, Paris Savette, who's a pretty famous uh, ra a DJ pers a DJ in in London, and um, she was with another lady named uh, Late Night Dancer. She was a dancer and a DJ, uh, and sh so she introduced us to a guy named Raymond Medweather in London, and he has a digital station called. SG1 Radio, and he has several channels, and one of the channels is SG1 House, and so he asked us if we would do mixes for his station. Now, we were like, I mean, what are we going to say? No, we're not, no. So, we, yeah, of course, and so out of this, um, I just, we just decided to call the show the Chicago Connection. A a a they wanted to call it uh, From Chicago with Love, but I just you know, hence the love team, which is what we call ourselves. But 
for, uh, Chicago Connection is what it had be has become. And there are other DJs that are on from around, around the country. Uh, so I really like that. Um, he is also the person that gave me my start in digital radio. He started another station called uh, SG1 Soul. And in overseas, in the UK, they consider black music, we call it black music, they call it soul music. Okay, so um, he was putting that format together and he asked me if I would be like the program director. And so he, he gave me a laptop and everything and gave me the software and showed me how to do it, walked me through, and this was in 2015. So digital radio uh, in terms of apps and stuff really hadn't started kicking off in, in the United States. So I was getting my, 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 my learning, making mistakes on his dime, learning so that now at this point, it's easier for me to sit and do it, you know, because I, I already know what to do. But again, a whole channel for house music. I know. How Let's do we talk to us about how we find Jams 98? How do we find So it? Jam 98, uh, I gave everybody a card. And okay. so when you scan the QR code, it, if you have an Apple phone or an Android phone, you can download the app. Uh, we're also available on Amazon Fire TV, the Beast Fire TV network on Roku, um, Amazon, no, uh, Amazon Music, uh, Live 365, um, Apple TV, Android TV, uh, radio.net, uh, we're available everywhere except for iHeart. And mm. I did not pursue iHeart Radio because I didn't want to be someplace where they already owned radio stations. Why? Because they're going to always promote theirs over yours. And at the end of the day, you're continuously promoting them and they are not promoting you. Right. I don't need that kind of drama in my I'm life. I'm sorry, Christy. I was listening to Sleigh Ride from Alexander O'Neill on Jam 98, Music <laughs> nice. for Your Soul. And nice. so, <laughs> so with, the, um, with the app, if you look, okay, so when you, when you do download the app, you'll see um, something that if you, you'll see like music, a music note, and the music note will tell you what songs you've been listening to. Alexander right. I wasn't lying. And then um, there's also, you'll see a little red microphone, and the little red microphone was my idea that I told the app developers that they put on the app. Now, mm. I didn't create the idea because I stole it from Stevie Wonder's app. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> I saw he had one, I'm like, that'd be cool. So I said, can you guys put a, a microphone on there where, where listeners that have the app, they can just click the microphone and leave like a 30 second message. Nice. Which means you don't have to call me. You ain't got to remember a phone number. Right. Just click and, and then there's also, a sh there's also uh, where you can make a request inside the app so you never have to leave the app. We have a podcast section that um, <laughs> houses the interviews that were done on the air. What do you know? Th there's a section for blogs, which will direct you to the website, jam98.com. Yes, right. There is a, something that looks like a movie, uh, movie strip that is the video section, which will show you different videos from, uh, from DJ in, in Amsterdam or in Chicago or in Detroit or whatever, um, as well as um, a share link. So the goal was to create something that could that could live in your hand that you never have to turn away from wow so that was the goal so even when you click into the blog it's going to take you to jam98.com where you'll be inside the website when you want to read the full story mm -hmm. so you're still inside the house which has value when you start to ask people to buy time on your station and you tell them hey you got a television commercial okay not only can we run the audio on the air but we have a video section where your commercial can actually live not only that we can do a blog post that has a picture of whatever your advertisement is with a read more they click that it'll say read more or watch more click that it'll take them to the video click the read more it's going to take them to the website and inside the website they're going to see all of your information with a link out to who you are See, they're not going to get to you until they come through us all those different ways. And um, also, the more places that your, that your station is heard, you know, it's heard all over the world, not just, in, not just in Chicago. The fact that you can get us anywhere, in your hand, on your TV, on your computer, in your car, you know. So that, um, we are currently one of the fastest growing digital streaming stations in the country. We are 16 months in and almost 5 million listening sessions. Oh, and wow. listening sessions are the amount of times that people come back to you. And like I told you before, people make the choice 5 million times 
they've made the choice to click that app or to go to that website, but to listen. They made the choice because they could have chosen anything else. So, Chrissy, you saying you and Hugo have a home on the moon now because of your radio station? No. No, I'm, I, I'm their way. I'm their way. That is extraordinary. We still get the yeah. bills, and I say put them back hey. in the mailbox. Look. <laughs> and send them to the moon, right? There you go. <laughs> Guys, thank you all so much for being a part of this discussion. We're going to let the audience now ask any questions they may have Ooh. of our two fantastic guests. Any questions? Be careful. There's got to be one. Come on, man. Sometimes it's good when people don't have questions. Oh, yeah, sometimes, but, you it's know. It's not always because they don't care because they just the, oh, there, Yeah, there's, there, one. there's a there question. Uh, thank you. This has been a great conversation. Um, I had a really technical question. Uh, you mentioned in, I think, 92 and 93, um, you were screening tracks for broadcast and doing editing to make sure that they were appropriate for air. Um, I was just I was just really curious like what technology or what equipment were you using to do that editing at the time? So back then there was um, there were two things that we, we used of course reel to reel that that you listening that you you know you record from Zacto the record knife. or because the CDs had really just started to c come into play um, so there was that and so it's it would be recorded onto the reel first and the edit would be done there. Um, usually by a guy named uh, the Curl Man, who's a white guy, who was on uh, uh, on GCI. Um, he would he would do that. Or for me, I would just say, Hugo, can you edit this? <laughs> See again. Look, look, I didn't marry him for his good looks. You know, <laughs> you know, we have in common. Uh, we both love music, both DJs. So it 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 works. And it's not that I'm too lazy to do it for myself, it's that he's better at it. Um, the Can other way. Yeah. Trying to see if anything digital. If I was using anything digital in 92. Um, yeah, because I had, I had like, well, still have like three or four reel to reels. So 90% um, um, of edits that I was doing back then, um, be it my club edits, disco edits, um, her, um, air checks, all that stuff was done on real to real. Everything. I think back then, uh, I think to this day, and I just saw him and told him, I think me and Steve Hurley were probably two of the most editing on real to real tape, where we would be using like three machines at one time, um, running loops and just doing all that type of stuff. So most back then, um, if an edit wasn't provided, it was probably done on reel to reel. A lot of it. Yeah, cutting tape. Cutting tape. Yeah, that cutting exacto tape. knife. Cut, yeah. Getting cut that tape, cut right yeah. and the, running it the, back like, oh, I missed the, the cut. With, with the white yeah. grease pen. Grease, all of it. Yeah. And I mean, I still, I, I'm, a, I'm a dinosaur with the equipment stuff. Like, it, technology comes and people sell this stuff. And yeah, the, I have storages of. I, I, all, I still have all my vinyl equipment, all my reel to reels, all that stuff. So, we also have it at home that was donated to us um, 360 Shortcut, which was really the first um, digital editing machine that we would use. But we didn't use it to play music, we used it to record phone calls. Um, Can't you hook that up now? Yeah, I could still hook it up. Thought, she just still said it. it I just now. thought about it, and I know where it's at. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. Yeah, we can still hook it up now because it still works. Um, so that was not many people used it for the purpose of of editing a song, but now it 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 then became what's called in for radio Vox Pro, yeah. which is which is the the upgraded version, which is really, in my opinion, just Adobe Audition. And Cakewalk is another one that that we started to use. And uh, was it Odyssey? Adas? Ad 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 
Audacity. Audacity. There it is, yeah. Is Which that when you guys would record the phone calls before you aired them to make yeah. sure that the people didn't lose their mind through the whole phone call? Yeah. And like if they won something? And that, was, that was in shortcut. Yeah, that was okay. a shortcut. And the other thing that, that uh, Rick and I would do that I learned <laughs> from him that, that I still would do now is you talk to somebody on the radio. You just talk to them for three, four minutes. You, they call and say, I want to hear such and such and so song. You say, yeah, okay, knowing you're not going to play that because you don't have the option to because it's already programmed for you. You say, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, um, well, tell me your favorite uh, Barry White song. Or, you know, okay, that's cool, that's cool. I got you, I got you. Say, I want to hear Beyonce. I want to hear Beyonce. Okay, thank you, click. Now when they hear themselves back on the radio, hi, this is Tanya from the South Side. I want to hear Beyonce. And Tanya's sitting at home going, I, I didn't, I didn't say hear any Beyonce. of that. And I didn't want to hear that, right? I remember Shit, watching. I asked for Marvin Gaye. I didn't ask for Beyonce. I remember yeah. watching Rick one night do that when he had took a call and it was about maybe a three-minute phone call while a song was playing. And he looked at me, he goes, watch this. And he took it. He literally took three pieces of this longer phone conversation put them together and it was just what you just described it sounded like this person actually wanted to hear this song that was coming up they did not want to talk about that song at all and just like at the end of the cover hey say uh so and so okay baby. and they said it and it was all in it I'm like damn dude that's tell everybody your favorite radio station that part uh that part <laughs> But that's the, that's the mastery of being able to use that technology and that equipment because you get what you need. And in those situations, especially with a GCI and corporate radio, you got to be like boom, 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 boom. You have to stay on that clock. You got to be on time because the next DJ does not care that you went over. It's not like talk radio where you might go over depending on how hot and heavy that conversation was. If it's music, it's on time. That's why everything is timed out. And the, and the songs are sped up. And they're sped up, yeah. They're sped up because yeah. uh, from, from the corporate standpoint, if I speed every song up and save 10 seconds on every song, and I'm playing 13 songs an hour, you know, whew, I could sell that extra time as commercials. Chris, because that's what it's really about. It's, it's why they took the point out. It was 107.5 yeah, yeah, forever. And then it was 107.5. To, because you can... And that GCI. Ec- yeah. Not, Not WGCI. WGCI. That took too long GCI. To say. W-G-C-I. It's all about that G-C-I. that little bit of time means more time to sell more stuff. And then also it's if you listen to B96, they don't they rarely if ever will talk going into the commercials. <laughs> um they don't do that. They their talk breaks are very very short because brevity is key, but you've got to be compelling. Uh, within those 30 seconds. That is something that black radio has not learned how to do. Not yet. Trust me. Uh, I can think of some people that do seven minute breaks and I'm like, why Man, are you still talking? There's no reason to do that. But unless it's some, <laughs> unless it's breaking news. But um, I say that to say the lesson that I took from, B, from B96 in doing that was I said, yes, yes, because they took the idea. Anybody watch Law and Order? Any kind of Law and Order TV show. Noticed how Law and Order, you hear the ding ding, and you know it's going to another scene. Then that scene goes off, and you wait for the ding ding, no but the ding, ding ding doesn't come. A commercial comes, and then as soon then it go, comes back, ding ding, and you see the last part, and it doesn't come on with a commercial before it goes to the next one. It goes directly into the next thing with the credits rolling. That's so they don't lose you. See, inside the middle of the show. You're going to stay because you want to know who did it. So they'll show the commercials there, but at the end, why show a commercial? Because you know the show's over, now you're going to leave. But if I start teasing you with what's coming up next, now you want to know who hit the girl and ran over her. So you're going to stay. Then I'm going to show you the intro. Then I'm going to show you the commercial. Why is Ice-T talking about cosmetic drugs that as a policeman he should have no knowledge of? Right. Well, he was undercover, so you know. Well, that. but everybody, everybody on the street is taking it. Now, how right. do you know? How do you know that? How you so know? That's kind of that's kind of what B ninety six. It's my favorite part of the form. show. So I took that and applied it to myself. So you never. Know. Sometimes I'll talk going into the stop set. Stop set mean when the commercials are gonna play, and sometimes I don't. So you don't know. Just so go now right you, in. you have to keep, you know, you have to keep listening. Something else that that we do, um, because of the magic of editing, um, you all know Mission Impossible, right? 
So I get the, get the music over and I see it says Mission Impossible. I'm like, oh, this must be a new song. And when it plays, I go, dun, 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 dun. and I'm going, Hugo, are you kidding me? <laughs> Everybody knows it. It's a jam. And people, you know, send it in text because you can also text us at 312-989-7754. Uh, <laughs> but um, people were texting, oh, man, not Mission Impossible. You know, the, the soundtrack to New York Undercover. It's only, it's only what, 45 seconds long? Yeah, his version is like almost three minutes, and he introduced it by playing it in a mix. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hearing it, and I'm like, where do I know that from? Where do I know that from? And then on TV, because uh, I didn't, I didn't want to ask him, because I never want to act like I don't know. And it comes on TV, and I'm like, oh, this food, and put the, <laughs> but it's doing things like that that used to happen in radio that don't happen now, those things that make you go, oh my goodness, watch the closing doors by I IRT. Oh, nice. yeah. I haven't heard that since I've heard it, <laughs> but you hear it with us, you know. So that's, um, that's one of the beauties of being able to have the option to control that and to give back to people, not just people in Chicago, because, the app is m reaches more than Chicago, but we get to bring Chicago to the world. Nice. So we get to bring house music, we get to bring Chicago hip hop, we get to bring uh, jazz and blues that was created here. We get to bring that to them as well as uh, gospel and stuff like that. So we get to bring that to your Detroit's, your Seattle, your your Londons, your Amsterdam's, and give them a taste of what it was like to live where we lived. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we connect because it's like, that's Barry White. I know Barry White. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm only 15, but I know Barry White because that's the song that Chris Tucker was singing at the beginning of uh, the movie, what was it, Money Talks. Right. In my verse, my So they know that. And so we know that music unites and connects, so we use mm -hmm. that. You know, so that's 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 the fun part of it, trying to bring the fun part back. That is amazing. What you're doing, both of you all, what you all are doing, are, is unbelievable and we really appreciate Chicago appreciate appreciates what you're doing our audience here appreciates what you're doing Mario Smith first lady thank you so much for being a part of this fantastic talk. thank you